multidisciplinary research, education, and outreach efforts, with the goal being to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable, resilient, and affordable energy systems. And the Ford and Energy Forum is part of our efforts at WI to cultivate public understanding of energy issues. This forum is a monthly series uh, that brings together experts both on and off campus uh, to discuss the many dimensions of our global transition to cleaner energy systems. Our goal is to encourage cross-disciplinary dialogue to explore the important technical, social, political, and economic dimensions of a wide variety of clean technology innovations and issues. Uh, a few announcements before we launch into today's forum. Uh, first, I would like to point out that uh, next month's forum will be on February 23rd. Um, and the topic for that is energy and housing justice. Uh, you can see the uh, lineup of speakers that we have confirmed for this session. Um, so we think it's gonna be a really rich conversation um, and registration is open. So we encourage you to register. Um, you can get all of our uh, Forward and Energy Forum uh, events, upcoming events uh, at the link on the bottom right of the screen. Uh, otherwise just go to energy.wist.edu and go to events and you should be able to find that. Uh, so we encourage many of you, all of you to uh, join us for next month. Uh, second, uh, one thing I'd like to acknowledge is the land that WI occupies, as well as all of you, W. Madison, is the second is the ancestral home of the Ho Chunk people, uh, who have called this land a joke since time immemorial. The Ho Chunk Nation and the eleven other First Nations residing in the boundaries of present-day Wisconsin remain vibrant and strong. We recognize and respect the inherent sovereignty of the twelve First Nations that reside in the boundaries of the state of Wisconsin. And also want to acknowledge that tribal nations are doing some of the most important and uh, leading work in transitioning towards clean and just energy systems. Finally, uh, for Q&A, uh, we ask that you submit your questions in the Q&A box. And between uh, our moderator, Karen Furlong, myself, and my colleague, Allison Bender, we'll do our best to address your questions to the appropriate panelists uh, for today's session. With that, uh, to kick things off, uh, our moderator today, moderator today is Kieran Furlong. Uh, Kieran is a senior fellow with uh, COWS at UW-Madison, and he is also a venture partner with uh, Rabo Ventures. He has extensive experience in the fields of renewable energy, chemicals, agriculture, innovation, and venture capital. Previously, he was a partner with Ireland Ag Tech Fund with Finisterre Ventures, and has worked in numerous startups uh, in the sustainability space and spent the early part of his career in the global chemistry industry, chemical industry. Uh, he's also mentored on-campus innovators in his role uh, at Discovery Your Product at UW-Madison. Welcome, Kieran. Well, thank you very much, Scott. And uh, welcome to all of our uh, viewers, attendees, and to, our, to the rest of the panelists here as well. So it was just last April that I was joking with friends that, you know, we should rent some tanker trucks and drive down to Cushing, Oklahoma, and get paid to take away crude oil because that was when we had that infamous day where there was negative oil prices and it went down as low as minus $37 per barrel. Now that stands in stark contrast to July, 2008, when I was working at a quirky little algal biofuel company in South San Francisco, and we were high-fiving each other as oil hit $147 per barrel. At that time, you know, concerns about peak oil abounded. Many of us in the biofuels world were convinced that oil prices would just keep going up. We were surrounded by discussions of peak oil and books like this one, predicting the imminent demise of the giant Saudi oil fields. Yet instead what we got was peak oil price. Oil hasn't been as, uh, the oil price hasn't been as high since. And while the negative prices of last April may have been a COVID induced aberration, West Texas Intermediate has languished under $50 a barrel for most of the year. In my days in biofuels and bio-based chemicals, we were constantly modeling oil price and crop prices, trying to thread that needle of where our bio-based commodity would outcompete petro commodities. But the $100 plus oil prices we were using are a long way from where we are today. So what does this mean for bio-based chemicals and fuels and the companies and technologies used to produce them? That's what we're going to be talking about today with a fantastic panel that I'm delighted to host. And I'm first of all going to introduce each of our panels very briefly, and then I'm going to ask them all to give some opening remarks on themselves, their company, and the topic that we're uh, getting later. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Beth Baker-Bannerman, who's the Chief Engagement and Sustainability Officer for Amaris, 
where Beth is responsible for setting the strategic direction for the company's communications, advising the CEO and executive team. Previously, she was head of communications at the World Bank of Scotland. And Beth started her career as a journalist and has earned a number of communication and engagement awards throughout that career, including the 2017 Cannes Silver Award for Corporate Film. So I can honestly say this is the first time I've been on a panel with a Cannes Film Festival winner. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce Charles Dimler. So Charlie's the CEO and co-founder of Checkerspot. Charlie started Checkerspot in 2016, and the company has been making waves with algae-based surfboards, sorry, snowboards and skis, uh, raising a $36 million Series B round late last year. Previously, Charlie was on the leadership team at Solazine, the pioneering company in biofuels and bio-based products, as senior vice president of corporate development. And there's a personal connection here too, which is why I'm especially delighted Charlie's on the panel, because I actually worked for him back when we built and launched the Algenus brand of personal care products at Solazine. So I'm really delighted to have you here today, Charlie, thanks. Um, we also have Rachel Brank, who's the chief of staff to the CEO at Lanzatech, a gas fermentation company that converts waste gases to ethanol and other fuels and chemicals. Rachel was the lead design process engineer on a first of its kind commercial plant in China, which successfully started in 2018. And I doubt we'll get into that more as we uh, start the discussion as well. And then finally, I'd like to introduce Bill Banholzer, who's a research professor and honorary fellow in the chemical and biological engineering department here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And Bill joined UW-Madison after a long and distinguished career in the global chemical industry, during which he served as a CTO for Dow Chemical Company and led Dow's venture capital, new business development and licensing activities. Earlier, he worked for General Electric and Savic. However, it hasn't all been big company activity as Bill now serves on the board of Pyran, a bio-based chemical spin-out from the University of Wisconsin. So that's um, the panel we're gonna have today. And I think we're gonna have a great conversation, but uh, first of all, we'll, we'll move into the opening remarks. And Beth, would you like to uh, start off? Thank you very much. Sure, thanks so much, Kieran. My name is Beth uh, Baker Bannerman, and I'm the Chief Engagement and Sustainability Officer at Amaris. Amaris is a biotechnology company that is located outside of Berkeley, California. There's a storm rolling in just now, so I hope my internet doesn't go down. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, so we make uh, sustainable ingredients for consumer brands. Some of the brands we own and some of the brands are owned outside of our company. So we sell ingredients through a B2B model and the direct consumer model. Um, when I first joined Amherst in 2018, the, uh, the mandate was to stand up uh, a story about uh, the journey of Amaris from a biofuels company, a biofuels uh, producer, into a producer of sustainable ingredients for different markets, which we'll get into later. But uh, quickly it became clear that we also needed to evidence every one of our claims around our commitment to sustainability. And so um, the production of an ESG report was added to my uh, list of responsibilities this year. And Amherst is gonna be producing its first ESG report uh, this year. So uh, super exciting and, and lots of work to do. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Beth. And uh, Charlie, you wanna come in next? Thanks, Karen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to join you guys in the discussion. Um, as Kieran mentioned, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Checkerspot. Um, like Beth, we're based uh, in the Bay Area in the East Bay um, in Oakland. So I'm hoping that the storm that rolls through doesn't knock out my power either. <laughs> and Checkerspot, as Kieran mentioned, is now four years old. Uh, we were founded in the summer of 2016. Uh, we're focused on innovating performance materials, performance materials that have the added benefit of being sourced more sustainably because they come from biology. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. I wanna start off kind of describing the problem as we see it in, in the market, what we're trying to tackle. And it begins with a little bit of a history of the petrochemicals industry, which is really about a barrel of crude oil whose primary product is transportation fuel 
that had other materials in it, other monomers that were looking for a home to uplift that barrel of crude oil. And so when we think about polymers specifically, you have to take into consideration two things. One, plentiful scale. There's a lot of them and they're super cheap as Kieran pointed out. And two, there's a finite number of different chemistries that can be derived from that barrel of crude oil. And what we've seen in the market is that there's only a finite amount of possibility of what can be done with those base monomers. And meanwhile, enabled by digital technology, we've just seen an absolute proliferation of consumer brands bringing products to market that leverage a lot of these polymers, but also functional ingredients that come from petroleum. And these brands are looking to differentiate themselves in the market to talk about something that is better performing or that delivers a promise to the consumer and they're struggling. There's demand for new kinds of performance ingredients that enable them to do something that is differentiated. And meanwhile, we've seen how there's increasing sentiment amongst consumers for solutions that are more sustainable, that don't harm the environment. So better performing materials that are more sustainable is where the demand lies. The petrochemical industry isn't innovating fast enough. And when you go back and you look at the data over the last several decades, what you'll see is as a percentage of revenue, R&D spend has been declining over the last few decades. And where there is investment in innovation, it's really about optimizing supply chain and driving profit, not innovating new things for the reasons that I articulated before. And this is at the heart of what CheckerSpot is focused on, thinking about how to innovate performance materials that solve problems in the market by leveraging biology. We can access a broad array of naturally occurring oils that come from plants that have been entirely ignored never interrogated or explored by the petrochemical industry because they haven't been available at scale and at an attractive cost structure. And this is what biotechnology unlocks, the ability to access those unique monomers that aren't available at scale historically, but to plug those genes into a microbial expression system to be able to produce at large scale. And this is activity that's been ongoing now for more than a decade. And this is important because the CapEx, the physical ability to produce these oils at scale with microbes exists. What we're commercializing today at CheckerSpot are three materials. We've entered into the market with two urethanes. One is a poured urethane that replaces ABS plastic in certain applications. The other is a urethane-based composite. Both of those urethanes are engineered for physical properties that have performance features, specifically light weighting and damping or energy absorbing properties. And the third material that we're currently commercializing is a textile finish that is being utilized for wicking, moisture management, pulling moisture away from the skin. Think of base layer um, that you would use for aerobic activity. We've entered into the market initially, as Kieran pointed out, in outdoor recreation. We launched a brand called Wonder Alpine that's commercializing the two urethanes in a backcountry ski. Wonder Alpine, the wonder is uh, disemboweled. There's no vowels. It's W-N-D-R. So if you're interested in checking out the product, please visit the website wonderalpine.com. This product has gotten recognition and has been noticed uh, internationally. Uh, most recently, we received the ISPO uh, Product Innovation Award in Munich. This just happened yesterday. We've also been recognized by Free Skier Magazine and by Fast Company's Innovation by Design Award, as well as from uh, Blister Gear Review. And the user reviews, product reviews from customers has been completely off the charts. Now, it would be a mistake to think of Checker Spot as a ski company or even an outdoor recreation company. It's not a coincidence that we targeted urethanes and targeted light weighting and damping as the initial physical properties to bring to market. It's those same physical properties that matter in the automotive industry, in the aerospace industry, when you think about fuel efficiency. But when we sell into those other industrial segments, 
having an actual supply chain, actual cost of goods, data, an innovation platform with more to follow is paramount in being able to enter into these other markets. And our partners have taken notice. We've announced a partnership with the Japanese chemical company, DIC. Last year, we announced a partnership with Gore, the makers of Gore-Tex around innovating performance textiles. And we have a partnership with a Swiss-based specialty chemical company by the name of Beyond Surface Technologies. So in four years, we've established partnerships. We have brought product to market, three materials. We've launched a brand. And we've raised a little more than $50 million. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of who we are, what we've done, and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. That's great. Thanks, Charlie. And congratulations on the ISBO Award. That's great news. Thank you. And, uh, I think you've laid down a challenge to Bill as well on the lack of innovation in the chemical industry. <laughs> but maybe Bill was one of those guys internally saying, I need more budget for my R&D. We'll see. But next up, I'm going to ask Rachel to give us her opening remarks. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to the University of Wisconsin and the Ford and Energy Forum coordinators. Can't be easy these days coordinating events in COVID times, so appreciate it. And uh, thanks to my fellow panelists, looking forward to the conversation. Um, so I'm Rachel Brank, I'm our Chief of Staff here at Lanza Tech, but I do come from an engineering background. I worked on the design of our pilot and commercial plants before taking on this role. Um, and when I joined Lanza Tech back in 2014, we were actually still demonstrating our technology, so I hadn't commercialized yet. It's been a wild ride as we've uh, gone straight through to commercialization and beyond. Um, Lanza Tech is a carbon recycling company that takes waste feedstocks, waste gases specifically, and converts them to products. Um, it's a fermentation platform, but unlike a traditional fermentation platform, it's a continuous process. And instead of using yeasts and sugars as a substrate, we take um, bacteria, microbes, um, doing the work um, on gaseous substrates. Um, and that's how the microbes get their carbon and energy is from the feed gas. So um, our process can accept all sorts of wastes, you know, traditionally steel mill off gas, refinery off gas, but a cool part of the technology is you can unlock all sorts of waste solid feedstocks by adding a gasification unit and then feeding in the syngas from all manner of agricultural residues. Um, my personal favorite municipal solid waste or unsorted garbage can go in, right into a gasifier. You can then take the gases and make a product from it. So it's really a flexible platform technology. Um, and the key to any feedstock in our process is just that it is low cost, point sourced, abundant, and, uh, and not competing with food. So our flagship product produced by this biocatalyst is ethanol. Um, and there are a lot of things we can do with that ethanol. We can sell it into the fuel market. Um, but more importantly, we can also add value by converting it to a more complex molecule, such as jet fuel, polyethylene, glycols, um, that technology exists today. Um, and we've done just that. We've um, done pilots of jet fuel and pilots of these, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And um, um, we've commercialized the technology. So to date, we've produced at our first commercial plant in China over 20 million gallons of ethanol, mitigated over 100,000 metric tons of CO2 in the process. Um, and um, since then, it's been uh, a great opportunity worldwide to roll this out. Great. So, yeah, yeah. And um, one final point is just that we're not limited to ethanol. With the power of synthetic biology, we can really go above and beyond, uh, per Charlie's comment, what fossil fuels can offer by putting in new biocatalysts where you can make new molecules like acetone, isopropyl alcohol, uh, directly in the process using the same platform reactor technology. Uh, which is really exciting to us and the next generation of uh, bio-based products. Very good. Sounds like Charlie may have to come along with some of his target molecules and see if he can turn carbon monoxide into those for him. Very good. All right. Well then, and Bill, you want to wrap it up here with uh, your opening remarks. Thank you. Sure. So I've been very fortunate. I've been able to work on chemicals that range from small scale specialty chemicals for the electronics industry up to massive petrochemical complexes from oil. Uh, and so the scale I've been involved in have been sort of small $10 million kind of pilot plants up to $20 billion major integrated petrochemical plants. And uh, I have, a, you know, a big admiration for the transformation biology can do. So it, 
in agrochemicals. So at Dow, we had a, a have a major had a major agrochemical business that sold agrochemicals from herbicides, insecticides, but also did seeds and traits. And and in agriculture, if you don't have a good biotech pipeline, you you were not going to be sustainable. And so so I'm a huge advocate for the application of biotechnology in the right application. Where I've been very critical is that I think it was overapplied. When you look at biotransformations, fermentation, biological digestion, any of these processes, they have a fundamental disadvantage in that they start with impure feedstocks, they involve big separations, and when you try to go after commodities like fuels, it was just ill-conceived. You start out with something that's got low energy density, it's hard to transform, it needs a lot of waste, and, and so I've been pretty openly critical of trying to misapply a tool to what I argue is low value products. And uh, you know, if you look at things that are chiral or long molecule chain molecules or high specialties, but those command a different price premium. You have different uh, manufacturing economics, but I look at everything within the context of, is a business gonna make money? And, and so I do agree that you know, petrochemicals could innovate more, but that's been said for 50 years. I mean, the, all, the question is you're never innovating fast enough. And, and when we were at Dow, we were pretty agnostic to feedstocks. We didn't really care where things came from. You just had to look at what do people want in the market? If it's urethanes for coatings or, and, and we had a big urethane business or composites or plastic for garbage bags or you know, whatever product the, the, you know, the world was requiring, how is it the best and cheapest and most sustainable way to make it? And you know, the way I try to describe it is the whole chemical industry started out from bio-derived products. You know, ethanol was the first thing in, a, in the F, uh, when Henry Ford made his first uh, truck to you know, the dyes and pigments. And, and we started out with bio sort of derived products and we moved to petrochemical and fossil fuels because they're just better. They're, they're higher in energy density, they're more pure, they're cheaper to transform, they have more capital intensity. And at, at Dow, we were looking for every other way. So we looked at gasification of biomass and coal. And, but if you put a gasifier in there, that's a whole nother capital thing you've got to pay for. And, and so the way I look at this, and, and, but I am involved in Pyron because it's a specialty molecule. And in that case, they can make a 1,5-pentane diol that can go into codeines and other uh, poly, poly, polycarbon and polyesters and other things cheaper than you can make it from fossil fuel. So again, being agnostic to feedstock, it's just here's a product that the market could use and here's a cheaper way to make it and it's a great fit. And so I look at everything through the lens of, you know, the market will only pay so much. You have to have a value proposition of do you create value? And then what is the cheapest way for us to make it? And a lot of companies pivoted from biofuels to materials because they had created more value. Um, I think that is appropriate. The mistake is that the chemical industry doesn't make a lot of money either. And so a lot of those products have already been optimized over 100 years. So selectively picking which molecules are the best targets, which means they're hard to make by other means, they have unique value and you can't supply them. So long chain oils, like I said, chiral compounds, you know, complex active pharmaceuticals, insecticides, um, the, what I call the pseudo specialty molecules are really good targets. And there it's just gonna be, can you make your plants bigger and cheaper? The last comment I'd make is scale. You know, the, the chemical industry operates at trillion dollar scales. Chemical plants are a hundred million to a billion dollars and plus. And so when people see a lot of, you know, product announcements and there's these 10 million pounds, you know, those are in the chemical world still hobbies, you know, they're not full scale. And so the big question is what's the adoption rate gonna be and how far do they go? And, and I think if you pick your niches right, you can make very good businesses like our other panelists. But when you try to apply it broadly to the whole chemical industry is gonna switch, you could end up like DuPont, which you know, DuPont made a big push into biological drive stuff. They, they came up with polypropane diol and tried to make PPT. And you know what, the world didn't really want it. It didn't, it cost too much. and and you know, they suffered. Their cell so ethanol uh, work all collapsed. Uh, and so I think, you know, it, it requires really good diligence on understanding the market, the value proposition, what your cost position is, what alternatives are. And then finally, I'll say I've spent in 30 years in industrial chemistry. I've never seen a product fail because technically we couldn't do it. Everything we set out to do, we could find a way to from Soy, oil, soy based oil polyols to, for polyurethanes to, uh, 
taking glycerin to make propylene oxide. We could do all of these things. The issue is they failed because of market acceptance, cost position, or supply chain issues. So that's what I you know, would, would encourage everybody to think about is you've got to answer all of these questions to be successful. And if you choose your markets right, your products right, your value propositions right, you've got a good choice or a good chance. It's still not great, but a good chance. Well, thanks, Bill. You know, Dow and DuPont, didn't you guys all buddy up now, at least in the ag world? It was, um, you can't be just throwing DuPont under the bus here, but your Dow background, Bill, come on. So I, I'll give you my perspective. I wasn't there or part of the whole thing. The, the Dow had a very good, even if I say so, biotech pipeline, but they didn't have a big enough market share. So if you're gonna integress a gene for herbicide tolerance and you only have 10% market share, you know, that costs $100 million to do that. And DuPont had great market share, but they didn't have quite the good. So that was a very good combination and, and always made sense. But the Dow was a, a chemical portfolio as was DuPont. DuPont made this shift to say, look, we want to derive most of our products now from bio-based materials. We wanted to get into biotransformations and they were under serious activist attack. Their, you know, their, their earnings hadn't grown, their markets. And so, when I was there, we tried to do a deal in agriculture because we wanted to take on Monsanto. And, uh, and you know, they didn't want anything to do with us. They thought that they were fine by themselves. And so we couldn't get that together. Um, and, but, and then I left in 2014. So after that, though, the activist pressure just came through the roof. DuPont's Thank margins were measure. under pressure and, and they were under serious, you know, talks about dissolving and spreading apart. And, and so the dupont Dow merger was a thought to try to take and put these things together in a better way. But um, it was because DuPont was under a lot of pressure, not because, you know, Dow wasn't interested earlier. Well, well, we'll come back to one of the other points you made too, Bill, around scale, because I think that's really important in terms of selection. But we may also mention the great diaper shortage of 2012 um, uh, as we get into it. Um, I see Tim is off to a flying start on the questions here in the chat, and Matt's got one. So maybe Tim had asked about um, feedstock and I see Beth and Charlie have both put your answers in there, but maybe there's a bit of a more nuanced answer there on feedstocks. You know, what feedstocks do you use? How do you answer someone who's coming at you with, are they sustainable or not? Um, you know, and you know, anyone who's been in this industry long enough will have lived through the food versus fuel type debates as well. So maybe just expand a little on the feedstocks of choice, in particular, uh, Beth and Charlie. Okay, uh, I'll kick it off. We use sugarcane. We use sugarcane specifically in Brazil. We love the fact that it has abundant sunshine and abundant rain, uh, and it's uh, one of the most regenerative plants on the planet. So, for example, you know, we we create a number of different molecules. In fact, we've commercialized and scaled 13 molecules. We have 18 in the pipeline. So we say that our lab to market pipeline is, uh, has 31 molecules in it right now. Um, I could tell you stories about each of those ingredients, but it all starts with sugarcane. And uh, we were most recently um, certified uh, bon sucro. So what does that mean? Bon sucro is a certification that ensures transparency, fair trade, non-GMO, uh, feedstock. It is, bon sucro is kind of good sugar. It's kind of like a, a good guy certification for sugar. And we're the first biotech uh, to receive the certification. Normally sugar companies would get bon sucro certification. Um, to give you an example of um, the benefits of using sugarcane, um, if I were to use one of our ingredients, which is uh, squalane, it takes about the size of an eight by 10 rug of sugarcane. Uh, to create about a kilogram of squalane. And squalane is this amazing moisturizer that is used in all types of uh, skin oils, um, but we sell it in tiny little bottles like this. And so for an eight by 10 rug uh, of sugarcane that you can replant year over year over year, you don't have to wait, you don't have to rest the fields. Um, we have a sustainable supply. so. One of the principles that we use at Amaris when we're making ingredients or when we're making choices about what ingredients we actually make, we use a filter called no compromise. It's, it's actually a, a principle that we stand on, which is, it's kind of what Bill was saying, really. It's kind of a very 
simple filter, which is, can we make it at a competitive cost to the traditional manufacturer of that same molecule? Can we make it from a sustainable source? And can we make it so that it performs as good or better than the existing material? So our no compromise principle is used against uh, everything that we do. Um, and again, it all starts with, with sugarcane. Thanks. And, and, you know, I mean, lest we have the perfect being the enemy of the good, I think it bears pointing out that prior to this kind of technology we were swaling from was whales and shark livers. So um, I think sugar came from a field might be slightly, slightly preferable to that. Charlie, did you want to weigh in on the uh, what good guy certification you might be using? Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo a lot of what Beth just described um, in terms of the virtue of sugarcane. We also use sugarcane. In fact, the materials that I mentioned that we're currently commercializing all came originally from sugarcane converted by microalgae into oils that we then apply chemistry to. Um, what I would add that maybe is a little bit different is that we're agnostic on the source of the feedstock. We can use a range of fermentable sugars and ultimately, the, the most significant litmus test is what's, what, what feedstock is available at the lowest price, at the greatest scale, with the least impact from an environmental perspective. And that last point is really important for us, uh, going back to the founding of the company. Um, you know, we incorporated as a public benefit corporation, and that's important because in our articles of incorporation includes two public benefits, one of which is about environmental stewardship. It's ingrained in the DNA of the company. It's why we named the company Checker Spot after a butterfly that's endangered due to climate change in the Sierra Nevada. It's part of who we are, but yet to really succeed commercially, our thesis is you have to deliver something that's performing better, which is why the, the foremost consideration for us is bringing products and materials more specifically to market that have performance advantage. Okay, very Here, good. And one of the things that you um, mentioned was about the sharks. I think that's a, I was just thinking about that. Um, so our squaling, you're right. Uh, we call our squaling sugarcane squaling. But the traditional um, sources of squaling come largely from deep sea sharks or from olive oil. And olive oil, as you know, there is weather, there are crop yield uh, fluctuations. And deep sea sharks, well, there's only so many of them. And in fact, Texas A&M just did a, uh, a research study this year that said that the number of deep sea sharks is declining, um, declining quite a bit. And it has been declining over the last 70 years. But one of the things that Bill mentioned was really around, I think, Kind of the, the big organizations partnering with biotech or creating a, an innovative uh, kind of incubator inside uh, a larger company. So how does Dow and DuPont kind of move quickly? What we have found is that as Amaris, we are kind of the speedboat and we have found great success when we partner with big, big companies. So for example, we talked about squaling. Well, squalane, um, you know, right. So we probably save, I think it's about 3 million sharks a year in the production of our squalane. We also produce a, a derivative of that called squalene, so spelled with an E. And we're using that now um, as an adjuvant. An adjuvant is essentially a booster, a booster for, for shots, for vaccines, right? And so there's a demand for vaccines, not just for COVID generation two and three or variants, but influences in the future. And so we can save sharks by creating a, 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 a deviation of the squalane called squalene. And we're working with big pharma to actually test and trial the use of our squalene with their vaccines. Why? Because if you used an adjuvant or a vaccine booster with a vaccine, you broaden the immune response. You actually make the vaccine more effective. And so you can make that vaccine material go along a lot farther. So a little goes a long way. So, and the fact that we can scale it from sugarcane um, and, and create a billion doses in a month, which is true, and get it out to all parts of the world that doesn't require negative 94 degree temperatures to transport it is kind of, a, there's a lot of good things to say about that, but actually we, we, never, we never claim to be a pharma company. We're not trying to be a pharma company. We're not trying to be Dow or DuPont or any of these other big companies. But we think that there's a place for us to partner up 
uh, with other companies, with NGOs and with government, in fact, to kind of bring what we do forward. Great, and uh, uh, Bill, I see you've got your hand up. Did you wanna weigh in on this one? Yeah, I think another real quantitative useful tool is life cycle analysis, because we all talk about sustainability and, but then you don't want it to be sort of somebody's opinion of what's sustainable. And, and the classic example is a paper gar, uh, gar, uh, gar, uh, grocery bag better than a plastic grocery bag. And, and how do you think about these things? And life cycle analysis, where you look at from the cradle, how is the material sourced? How is it made? If it's corn, how much do you count the fertilizer that had to be used to go into it? all the way through its use and end of life, it's a way that's becoming more and more accepted as a quantifiable way to decide what's sustainable and people can compare bioplastics versus fossil fuel plastics or, or you know, renewable, depending on what that means, is renewable really good? And, and so unfortunately we don't teach it enough in, in our universities and it's something that I think is, is critical because it does give you a lens to really look at it. And, and, and I think it's something that we you know, have to look at one of the uh, interesting findings is if you really look at life cycle analysis, a lot of bioplastics are actually worse when you count everything that's in them than some of the fossil fuels. And, and especially if you look at greenhouse gases, we're worried about climate change. You know, once you have a plastic, if it doesn't decompose, that plastic is captive. And, and so, whereas if it's, you know, bio-derived or biodegradable, that CO2 is going to go back up in the atmosphere. And, and one of the things that we found really interesting was, so we actually built we were planning to build a world scale polyethylene plant in Brazil using sugarcane because Brazil had import duties. They didn't have a lot of natural gas. And, and what we ended up finding out is that, uh, of course, they found a bunch of low cost natural gas. And, but that was a, ends up being, even though we could do it, it was only going to work in Brazil. Because if you looked at the polyethylene footprint that Dow had and said, well, we'd like to do this and expand it, you would need to take the entire surface area of Wisconsin and half of Illinois to be able to make the polyethylene that the, you know, the US asked for using sugarcane. So as good as sugarcane is, when you scale it to something like polyethylene, you run into a land utilization issue. Life cycle analysis was sort of break even and it was a you know, back and forth. And, and that plant, we actually got, you know, when you do a sugarcane plant, you actually plant six fields because you plant one each year because the, the sugar peaks and goes down. So we were in year four of our planting fields before we realized, you know, this isn't exactly gonna work out. So that was a case where it was an interesting market, but just the logistics didn't work out and polyethylene wasn't valuable enough to sort of continue. Um, whereas, you know, other markets, the value of the product would have allowed it to go forward and you wouldn't have needed as big a scale. Thanks, Bill. So some other day, perhaps Bill on another forum, we're gonna have that land use debate because I'm the heretic who thinks we've got plenty of land. There's lots of <laughs> underutilized farms out there and farmers looking to grow stuff. So. But Charlie, I see you have your hand up, but we're also getting a bunch of questions in here too. So how about I try and address some of those and you can weigh in with your comment then uh, as part of that, right? So, and Tim, don't be shy. Keep the questions coming, they're great. Um, there was one question and it was, I think it was actually one of Tim's one, we'll come back to yours, Jill, but uh, was asking about the key value metric if possible on what customers are seeking. And he's talking about bio-based, but I want to make sure we get Rachel in here as well, because Lanzatech kind of operates in this, you know, in-between space where it may indeed be fossil carbon, but rather than that fossil carbon escaping up the flu stack, it's being converted into something else that's uh, useful. Um, so you're kind of in between, you're partly on the, I mean, you talk about municipal solid waste, you're veering into the waste disposal is my product, um, as, as well as, you know, you have a byproduct of producing a good. So maybe uh, Rachel, you could talk about Tim's question on the key value points that your customers, why did that factory in China ask you guys to come and build a plant there? Sure, yeah, and I, and I think it's the, the dual proposition of not only can you uh, mitigate emissions, right? This would have been carbon that would have been burned to CO2, sent out the flare stack in the worst case, incinerated um, in the second worst case, um, used for power generation and you know, which is pretty inefficient. Um, so not only can you prevent those emissions, but you can use the most possible energy in that feedstock by fixing it in products uh, in a biological process. And you're right, technically steel mill off gas is, you know, if you look all the way back to what's going into the steel mill, it is not biological, right? It's fossil. So um, kind of reframing that um, image that, you know, 
renewable products don't have to come from originally bio-based has been a really important part of Lance Tech's message and growth over the years. Making sure that we get policy to include us, this recycled carbon fuel option is, uh, is really important to us. Um, I'd say the key metric, I think um, Bill absolutely nailed it. Life cycle analysis is really key, especially when you start delving into consumer brands and partnerships. Every single company has asked us about the um, you know, GHG emissions reductions associated with the product. And it's nice to be able to say, yes, you know, 80% reduction in emissions uh, over typical gasoline in a fuel case and, and more if you're actually fixing it. Um, and I'd say getting the certification. Say it again. Are they able to monetize those reductions, Rachel, through a kind of a carbon credit trading scheme, or is this more around living up to our corporate or you know goal? And I have that in the in the sustainability report at the end of the year. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's both. It's both. So when it comes to brands and consumer products, it's definitely the goals that they've set out, the um, promises they've made. But you also are starting to see um, uh, programs that do. Uh, take into account the carbon reduction of the products. Um, in, in China, for example, that's not the case. You know, we're not working under some sort of government mandate or some sort of um, you know, CO2 tax, but um, it definitely can improve the economics of projects in other regions where that is an option. Okay, very good. Um, Charlie, did you wanna weigh in? Your hand's up still, I'm just making sure. Um, yeah, I'll just comment on what why I put my hand up, I was going to reinforce one of the remarks that Bill made around the importance of LCA, um, which is really significant. At the same time, you know, for better or worse, it seems like we're, we're in a world now where there are alternative facts and where, you know, to, to use the old saying, there's, you know, lies, damn lies and statistics. Like if you live and breathe within an echo chamber, you can find a consulting company that's gonna do an LCA that supports the case that you're trying to make. And that's something that if you're really trying to pursue an opportunity authentically, you would be really well served to get a third party that is, has no connection to you as an organization that isn't being paid that can really opine on what you're doing and whether it truly is better for the environment. And there are groups that do that, for instance, B Labs. And one of the things that we did early on in Checker Spot's history is engage with B Labs to get a B Corp certification, which we succeeded at doing. And it is true that that has benefit in the context of um, what we represent to a variety of stakeholders, but the most valuable thing for us is that B Labs forced us to think about considerations that were blind spots for us, that have helped us to improve how we tackle sustainability, how we think about LCA. And so I just wanted to touch on that and reinforce the value in thinking it through, but having somebody do it that isn't being paid by your organization. Right, and that's a real challenge for this whole industry where everyone kind of wants to get to a simple sticker on the consumer label but there's a lot of complexity in the life cycle assessment before you even get to be able to call it an analysis, right? Thanks. Um, so back on the Q&A here, um, Jill had talked about the uh, non-technical factors that limit the widespread adoption of bioproducts. And I agree with Bill wholeheartedly that there's very little that we see that's technically impossible, right? I used to work for a chemical company that had phenomenal engineers and chemists, but it's no longer around because the business side wasn't so good. Um, so Bill, maybe you start off uh, the answer there to Jill's question on what are these non-technical factors and specifically Jill, and it's probably relevant to a number of our audience, you know, what are the things that researchers can do to try and address those versus just focusing on, well, I need to get this technical solution to work. Yeah, so I, I think about business pretty simplistically because it sort of works, which is that you have to answer three questions. You got to know, look at your product and say, is this something people want? So if it's a fuel, they just want their car to go from A to B. And then, and, and nobody's going to have a business with something that somebody doesn't want for the most part. Um, then you got to say, but will they pay for it? Because, you know, one of the classic issues is, will people pay a premium for something? So for health, we'll pay a premium. You know, will we pay for organic uh, food, organic milk, grass-fed milk, because there's a health benefit there. And that's a value that 
I don't mind paying a premium for it as a consumer and most other people do. When you get to, well, it's green, pretty well established. There's a part of the population, you know, the Prius owners, there's, there's maybe five to 10% of the population will pay a premium, but the majority aren't going to pay you a premium for something that does the same thing, even with the awareness of, of climate change. So you've got to understand, is this something people will pay for? And that needs good marketing studies. And, and then the, the third, and, and the sort of, there's a corollary to that is, and can they afford it? So even if somebody can afford to pay for, or wants to pay for it, you know, can they really afford to pay for it? Is there enough money or disposable income that they can actually do it. A corollary to that is, is the green premium or the green product really compelling? Like we said, it's gotta be third party, it can't be subjective. You've gotta have a good story that explains why it's value. The win is you need to have a, a value product, something that really better, people don't have to compromise on price or quality and, and it has to be cost effective. And you know, so polylactic acid is one of my favorite course studies where, you know, polylactic acid is a crappy polymer. People knew about it for its old polymer and they knew about it. Nobody wanted to make a package out of it, but, but to, to Pepsi's advantage, you remember Sun Chips, the Sun Chip bag, they took, they wanted to be green. They said, all right, we'll, we'll take a cost premium because they're selling their chips. The bag just has got to get the chips there. And they say, Hey, you know, I just want this to be green. And so as a good corporate citizen, we're going to pay a premium because we can afford it. Sun Chips had enough margin, I guess. And then you didn't realize how fickle consumers are and the market are. So if you look at YouTube, the Sunship bag by PLA does everything you want. If you were making the bag, you didn't like it because it, it, it was easy to burn. It was hard to process, but you could make a bag. You could print on it. It looked good. The chips, you know, didn't fall out of the bag. It sealed them good enough. If you did a CF, sort of, we call it a, a quantifiable CTQ, critical to quality of what a bag had to do, this hit everything other than, than price and it had the benefit of being bio-derived. But people didn't like it because it made too much noise when you opened it. And there was all these YouTube videos of people crying. And it's like, you know, here they're trying to do the right thing. There even was a cost premium the consumers didn't see, but the, 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 you know, the general consumers just said, oh, I don't want a bag. Because, and where on the CTQ flow down was, oh, and the bag can't make noise. And so understanding, you know, yeah. what do people really well, want is just part of the consumer experience, right? Yeah, so That's part of the product that you open your bottle of soda. Yeah. It's part of the consumer experience, right? Our smell or so understanding all of these things are, are part of that assessment of, do I have a value? And then the last part is you need to understand what the alternatives are, because if you're probably, for the most part, the world can do everything it wants to do. We can make garbage bags. We can make you know, automobiles, we can make, you know, fuel. But the issue is, if you're going to do something different, you've got to say, all right, well, will somebody switch? And what are the alternatives? And why, why do I have a value? And uh, um, now you, you can, that can be perturbed by the government. Ethanol is a great example. Renewable fuel standards forces us to have ethanol. Ethanol is an inferior fuel. It's got lower energy density. You take your 20 mile per gallon car and you put ethanol in it and you go 14 miles per gallon. It, it's, I have snowmobiles and ski boats and I, I pay a premium just to not have to use ethanol. So it's, you know, it's the opposite of sort of what you think, but understanding all of those variables is what it takes to be a successful business. And, and the issue is sometimes, even though you do your very best, consumers don't even know what they want and, and can lie. So, so it's a, it's a hard problem, but I would argue any company ought to spend two thirds of its budget on that understanding alternatives, understanding its costs, understanding what customers want, and one third on developing a technology. Most startups spend, you know, 10% on understanding the market and, and all their time trying to develop a better process and then it fails. And 90% and of small businesses fail because they, they sort of don't do the marketing. So here's an engineer saying marketing is important, but everything I did wrong, and I also found it's a lot easier to teach marketing to an engineer than it is to teach engineering to a marketing person. So so, you know, you've got to have good teams that can help each other. I feel like we're witness to Bill's Damascene moment where the clouds part and the engineer and chemist in him is told, you know what, you got to listen to the consumer. So in answer to Jill, I guess what we'll say is, Jill, I mean, what you got to do is get out of the lab, go talk to people and go observe people, see how they use the products that are out there as well. Um, so just a comment to the audience, love the questions coming in, keep doing it. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, if we don't, by all means, send your questions by follow-up and we'll try and answer them by email afterwards. Um, so hopefully that's answered Jill's question. Chris, I, oh, 
Beth, you want to weigh in here? Yeah, just really quickly, I, uh, on the on the topic of because it is a marketing topic, let me just jump in real quick. Uh, I, I'd say that we're in a moment of uh, crisis when it comes to trust. Um, you know, Edelman uh, puts out a trust barometer. Edelman's an ad agency. They put out a trust barometer report every year, and this year uh, they put one out. They interviewed uh, half a million people in 27 countries, um, and what came through was really interesting. As a result of the pandemic. Um, there is even less trust now. Um, and as a result of political uh, maneuvering around the world, not just in the US, there is less trust around the information. Consumers are the, those same people that are taking these um, surveys. And so it's, it will show up when they're looking at labels as Bill said. And so there is an opportunity now for people to learn more about um, your product and they are becoming more savvy so in fact, uh, one of the data points I wanted to share with you is that there is a 43% increase in respondents this year who say that increasing their science literacy has become more important. So they're beginning to educate themselves. And that's a big open door for a biotech company who was wanting to educate people about what is our process and let me share with you my traceability and let me be transparent around fermentation and how it all works. Now we have an audience that's a bit more willing to actually listen to us. And the other point that was, was interesting is that they're looking for companies. There's a higher level in trust in businesses and CEOs than there is in government, NGOs, and the media. They're actually 68% of respondents had said that they are looking for CEOs to step into the gap, both in word and action, in terms of closing the need for society and environmental pro problems. So I think there's a big opportunity for biotechs and, uh, and I think uh, marketers or engineers, whoever you are, I think the time is now to kind of bring your two uh, skill sets to bear. And because we've got a, an audience that's more willing than ever. And actually, Beth, just, I mean, it's occurring to me in this conversation that, yeah, this has been a challenge for large consumer facing companies. The brands used to be a symbol of trust and that has definitely eroded. But even this conversation, we've talked about B Core, we've talked about Sucro. I mean, it's almost like, okay, it's almost, you've got these meta brands now, which are what people look to for trust as well. So it just reinforces the importance of what do those certification schemes and so on do, because they seem to be um, arbiters of the consumer trust, perhaps. We have um, three consumer brands in our family of brands. One is called Biosense. It's a skincare brand. One is Pipette, which is a baby skincare brand and a personal care brand. One is Pure Cane, this is a zero calorie sweetener. Uh, we just bought Terrasana. This is a, a skincare brand that has natural cannabinoids uh, as its ingredient. We're gonna be reformulating and introducing new products. We're building out a community of digital to consumer brands. And again, these are brands that are built around hero ingredients that are high margins, relatively low volume compared to some of this industrial uh, distribution of biofuels, et cetera, uh, but higher margins, lower volume and, and their specialty. But the the, the customers that we're, we're um, engaging with and the customers that are, are coming to us, we had over 200% increase in sales in 2020 versus 2019, uh, that's through the pandemic even, um, they are seeking us out and they are holding us to account. And, and I guess one thing that I would say is that they're asking us lots of questions and you can take cues for uh, positioning your brand and um, communicating with your customers just by listening to their questions, they can lead you to where, where their thinking is. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating how things are changing. Just, just this whole stay at home uh, experience that we've all been through has opened the door for people to make switches, to make product choice changes as a result of, you know, whether or not that product is, a, as, is eligible for prime delivery on Amazon. I might just give it a try. It's got lots of great reviews and it's a little bit cheaper. I can get it in two days. So, and so now all of a sudden there's an opportunity and we have found that to our advantage um, by being accessible and being convenient and being clear and, and really taking cues from what our customers are telling us, what they love about our products. And in fact, what they have questions on or what they don't like even, um, it has helped us continue to be relevant and continue to grow and ensure that they tell their friends because at the end of the day, it's, it is true, word of mouth is still the best, uh, the best marketing tool ever. Very good. 
Okay, so on the questions, we are going to get to Matt's question about trees in Wisconsin. But first of all, I figured I could do a twofer down here um, by wrapping Tim's question on common, uh, the, the role of climate impact, for example, particularly for you, Rachel, and then wrap Patrick's question to that as well around Lanza Tech in China. Um, and I think because he says in a more Western and open marketplace, I think there's some between those two questions is asking, okay, well, what's the role of, you know, a directed economy, but also what's the role of the, you know, climate impact, the carbon markets and so on for the adoption of Lanza Tech's technology as a starting point. Sure. Yeah. Thanks both for the questions and thanks Tim for the support. Um, yeah, absolutely. We have a robust commercial pipeline beyond just steel mill off gas, right? So um, we are looking at, um, we are, let's see, constructing a plant with uh, Sekisui in Japan to take municipal solid waste through to ethanol. Um, we've announced projects with uh, MRPL, which is um, an Indian refiner that's actually taking waste agricultural residues in India, gasifying them, taking them through to ethanol. So two big projects that show, you know, negative carbon intensity feedstocks that really have um, uh, a really powerful end result on the final LCA and then the final emissions reductions that are possible. So um, we definitely are seeing, you know, who would have thought an oil refiner would be interested in taking local waste agricultural residues. So it's made a big impact on their business models and, and who all is coming to us for projects, right? So um, we've seen great growth in that, in that area. Very good. Okay, so now I'm going to get to Matt's question because that's got a lot of thumbs up from other viewers as well here. Um, so for the panelists, Wisconsin has a long history in the forestry sector. Um, I think, Bill, you're up amongst the trees right now. But uh, in 2016, the value of the timber sales in Wisconsin was $21.6 billion. But paper mill closures hurt the timber industry. Is there a future where Wisconsin timber is the feedstock of a major biorefining economy in northern Wisconsin. How realistic is that vision? So for Beth and Charlie in particular, Rachel, you're not that far away, but yeah, we go about two hours north of here and it's just all trees, okay? Um, but it's a competitive global uh, market for, um, you know, uh, soft pulp for paper manufacturing and so on. Um, Maybe Bill, as, as the kind of Wisconsin representative here, you want to take a stab at that one? You know, the potential of the great North Woods being able to supply feedstock for a biorefining economy. So I, I think there's clearly an opportunity and, and I'd say there's nothing unique about trees. It, I mean, it could be any biomass. So it's pretty interchangeable. You sort of have this CH2O mess of stuff. And so the, uh, any process that could turn that into something that's more value added is, is potential and trees are a great uh, source. So one up in Marquette, Michigan, which is even north of here, there is a carbon uh, transformation plant where they take the trees and they, they're turning it into bio-derived charcoal for use in uh, st green steel. And, uh, and they're gonna scale that up. So the issue is you can only build a plant so big because of the ability to bring the, the same issue you have with ethanol plants is there's a radius issue and how far you transport it. And, but they've done their market research and have found that, uh, I think it's National Carbon is the, the people that do that, that in Japan, they're willing to pay for green coke for their smelting operations. And so there's a value that's there. Basically, it's also activated charcoal. But if the, so that's a place where they think they have a customer who's willing to pay for it, they can make something that's, but it doesn't work any different than just regular derived carbon. And so uh, via coal or whatever. And so the, the value is if the customer says there's value and they'll pay you for it. So I think if you can find opportunities like that, the general idea that you can just take tree mass and turn it into anything is true. But if you're gonna go through, remember as a chemical engineer, you learn you don't want mixtures of compounds at the start of your plant. You don't want mixtures at the end. You want pure feedstocks and pure products. And, and unfortunately, biomass doesn't give you either of those. So there's always that cost issue. So you've got to make sure you pick the right target molecule to go after. And, and this, this, this carbon is one, but I mean, it could be, you know, especially the oils. The disadvantage is, depending on what you break it down to, once you break it down, then you can make anything you want. You've got to be very judicious in what you choose to turn it back into so that you can get paid for the, the cost of getting the material and breaking it down and throwing away you know, a lot of that oxygen, you know, one of the things that people forget is fermentation 
throws four carbons away for every two that we get. And we don't care about it so much because that's carbon that came from the air in the first place. But, but as a chemical process, its carbon utilization is pretty poor. You know, if you said, here's my process and I'm gonna pay for six carbons and I'm only gonna get two of them back out, that's not a competitive process. So it, it's very complicated. Now, you can, if you can afford those two carbons to make them something special, you know, oil, you know, polymer, you know, it, it makes sense. But, but we've got to make sure we always understand that customer value proposition, who will pay for it, validate it, and then try to make the technology work. But I, I'd say trees are just as good a source as anything. And, and, and in some sense, they're denser, so there's more value. And um, the issue is trees have a slow regrowth. So, you know, up here, we have a lot of hardwoods and, and to build a plant and stick it up here and then have trees that take too long to grow, that, that's a little bit of a problem. You know, that's where people try to go to the, the, the grasses and the other things that sort of have, and the poplars that, that, that can replenish faster so that you, you can keep using the same uh, physical footprint. Right, and I think that's a key point there for any feedstock is, okay, what's its competitive advantage? You know, if it's a competitive advantage is its location, is it close to, you know, a downstream customer? Is it close to a whole lot of consumers? Is there something like that? But otherwise, Matt, I think in answer to your question, those trees in the Great North Woods are just competing against trees that maybe grow cheaper or faster somewhere else. And Rachel, I know you had your hand up as well, but I just wanted to add on, pile on to, to Bill's comment there. Please come in, Rachel. Yeah, and I would like to say that um, one thing that can help improve that whole issue of four, four carbons being wasted is the advent of green hydrogen and cheap electrons, renewable electricity being able to power um, electrolysis to make green hydrogen. When you can introduce that external energy source to the fermentation process, we can actually get to a stoichiometry where we can um, consume a ratio of one to one carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide and emit no carbon whatsoever. So I think that's a, a critical factor that's kind of becoming bigger and bigger around the world and a really big opportunity for fermentation to tap into. Right, and actually I think you're touching here on Chris's question around some of these technical issues that are most impactful on economic viability. We have to do with the tyranny of stoichiometry, right Bill? Right, that what, what mass, mass must be conserved and what's it converted into? Um, and I think green hydrogen will be a great way to do some more of these, you know, overcome the thermodynamic boundaries and hang on to more of that carbon as useful product as well. Um, so Chris, hopefully that will answer your question. Oh, Bill's going to weigh in again. Come on, Bill. Yeah, I, I couldn't let this go because it's a big concern. So I'm going to diverge from my general agreement with the panelists. Is I think green hydrogen is ridiculous. The idea that you're going to take electrons and split water and make hydrogen cost effectively, I just don't get. Because if I have an electron, the best thing I should do is just keep it as an electron and put it into the grid and, and decarbonize the electrical grid. And we don't have enough renewable. And renewable energy, you gotta remember, you know, solar and wind, which I mean, I love, but they only last a third to half as long as a, a gas-fired turbine plant. And so to put in so much renewable energy, it's gonna be trillions of dollars for the world. and and if I do have it, I have other places to use it before I turn it into hydrogen because you give up half of the energy in that electron to make the hydrogen out of it. So, to, so you, you do have to have a reducing agent, but, but the idea of ammonia, that's the biggest one. They want to make green ammonia. You're going to take the hydrogen. I think is, is misguided, and I don't think there's any way it's going to happen. And, and if you remember, electricity is the most valuable form of energy. So you know, if, if methane costs us $3 a million BTU, Oil might be six. Electricity is thirty-three dollars per million BTU if, if you take ten kilowatt hours. If you take it at three or four cents a kilowatt hour, it's still three times the price of chemical energy. So to take an electron and turn it back into chemical energy and give half of that energy away because of the inefficiency of the splitting process, plus I have to compress the hydrogen and move it around. And I I'm sorry, Rachel, I disagree. I well, but here's where I'm going to weigh in because I'm actually going to tie this back to our answer to Matt's question. It all depends on what the real estate agents will tell us, right? Location, location, location. Um, so, Bill, I fully agree with you. Like, you know, when I was at Virant, we had this question all the time. Well, could you guys use renewable hydrogen on that? I'm like, well, yes, we could if you want, and unicorn turds, but it's going to cost you, right? Um, so, but I do believe there's areas where the uh, renewable hydrogen is going to play a role. So you look at somewhere like Denmark, where you essentially have stranded electricity when the wind is blowing, right? 
That's a country where they're trying to figure out where can they stash their excess electricity. And they're seriously looking at technologies where you can take that hydrolyzed water, use that hydrogen to produce natural gas, that you can then put that into the natural gas grid in Germany and Central Europe. And then you can pull that gas back out to generate electricity on peaker plants the days that the wind doesn't blow. Capital efficiency needs to be considered, but it's another way of storing electricity, which is a fleeting temporary resort. So I think there's going to be some way of looking at how do we use those electrons that on normal economics, Bill, you're absolutely right, but some days you just got too much electricity. And I sometimes think that about corn in the upper Midwest as well. Sometimes you just got too much corn and that's why we're trying to stuff it into gas tanks and stuff. Back to your comments about ethanol earlier. Okay, so hopefully that touched a little bit on, on Chris's comment. Chris, you know where to find me um, if you want uh, the question answered in more detail. Um, we've got two questions left in the Q&A here. One is Jill's, which is a classic Madison question, which we'll definitely get to maybe as the finale. But then uh, Doug was asking your carbon pricing policy and how you know that helps. I'll start Doug with my own little analogy for this. Sometimes in the bio-based industry, when I was in it full time, I felt like you know you're that 12 year old or 14 year old high school footballer who all of a sudden is being plucked out, dropped into the Super Bowl, and expected to perform against professional athletes at the top of their game, right? You've got the petro industry, which has had a century and a half of development. It's got scale. It's much bigger than anything you know we could do in the bio-based. So it can it can be really hard to you know drop into the third quarter of the Super Bowl and throw that touchdown pass. So any of our panelists would like to take this issue around what kind of support is needed, or what carbon pricing policy would help um, bio-based materials? Charlie's weighing in. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things that come to mind um, for me on that question. And, and I like your, your analogy, Karen, because that's right. Like when we're introducing a new material, we're effectively going up against incumbents that have decades worth of supply chain and scale and cost in their favor. And so how you compete in that environment can be uh, really, really challenging. I think for us, like we're not banking, we're not expecting, nor are we investing strategically in the policy discussion. But, but when you take a close look at two things, number one, the subsidies that go to the petrochemical industry as compared to the bio-based industry, or when you think about the, the externalities the costs associated with the way of continuing to do business that the way that we have, that's not really captured in like the acute PL that Bill's referring to with respect to driving profit. And I think that we need societally to, to weigh that, to think about those externalities, to think about how we can support innovation. And I think by definition, anytime you're talking about innovation, you're talking about something that has a risk profile associated with it. And I don't think anybody on the panel or as part of this discussion would disagree that most innovation is, is, is set up to fail. It's not going to succeed. You have to have an environment where you can make little bets and you can see what works and what doesn't. And that extends to what the consumer is willing to pay for and willing to buy. I think it can be very easy to point to new technologies and give any number of reasons why something isn't going to work. But I think there's a lot greater benefit societally in finding a way to test those things, to finding ways to get things to work, especially where there are externalities that are at play, like the environment, like sustainability, like human health. And that's what we're up against with respect to the petrochemical industry. I think another thing, just to add on to that, Charlie, <coughs> excuse me, is the... Um, is this awakening, and maybe this is part of Jill's question, but there's this awakening to um, stakeholder capitalism. So we, we've all heard of uh, kind of shareholder accountability and you know companies measuring their performance quarter over quarter. But um, there is a, um, a bigger conversation that's being had right now about short-term cost savings and the long-term costs to the planet. And those long-term costs to the planet 
you know, they translate into health issues, they, they translate into economic instability, government instability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because of inequities that are caused by natural disasters that are occurring when they don't have the infrastructure to respond to it. So it is in our benefit to think about uh, a long-term view and using innovation or disruption really as a, as a way to get ahead of those higher costs that are gonna come in the end. I think McKinsey, you can, you can love McKinsey or hate McKinsey, but McKinsey just did a study on stakeholder capitalism as well. And, and their study showed that, uh, I think they looked at, it was over 600 large and mid cap US publicly listed companies um, in the last 15 years. And they said those with the long-term view outperform the rest in earnings, revenue, investment, and job growth. So I think there is something to be said for having a look at innovation, even if it doesn't really make a whole lot of economic sense in the short term, but kind of sticking to it because, um, because we have been able to disrupt industries time and time again over centuries and it's, just, it's, it's worth it. And actually we just don't have a choice. I think the other kind of maybe potential wind in our sail is that we've got an administration, politics aside, but we've got an administration who's ready to come to the table and start to put some money behind some of this innovation. And, and, and the irony, Beth, is that that's the history of the petrochemical industry. Like the first applications for Bakelite and the first applications for high density polyethylene weren't runaway commodity breakaway successes that worked perfectly. In fact, the first uh, applications for high density polyethylene were really sophisticated high end housewares that people would <laughs> yeah. give as gifts because it was so expensive. So, yes, that's where we're headed. Well, Beth, you've taken us into Jill's question, which I think we just finish off with this one because look, Madison is always trying to out Berkeley Berkeley where you are. And um, I mean, here we go. So as consumers, how can we use that influence for good? Is there any ethical consumption under capitalism? So I'll first of all tee up by saying, listen, we all need, we all need food, we need water, we need a roof over our heads, some clothing to keep us warm because we lost our pursuit you know, origins long ever ago in evolution. So there are definitely certain things we need as maintenance consumption for starters, but it can go too far. I used to be a Sierra Club member and then I got fed up with the glossy magazine they sent me every so often. That was essentially a catalog for all these fancy products. And Charlie, I hope the wonder Alpine skis are in there by the way. <laughs> um, but this is a tightrope that we have to walk. And I'll just say to Jill that look, I've been in this industry for a decade and a half and it does always come up. People have options. At Virant, at one point, we had that option of, well, hey, we can apply this technology to petrocarbon, you know? And we had one member of the executive team, Dollar Signs, was very much, that's what we should go. I was just like, well, listen, half, if not all of our employees are just going to check out. Some of them will actually leave physically. The rest will just be like, well, this isn't interesting anymore. A lot of people in this industry are doing it from an ethical standpoint as well. But that's my soapbox. Charlie, I know you and I share some of this from our time in Solar Design, but feel free. I think I'd like to get a closing comment from each of our panelists just on that, you know, kind of, if you like, the, the moral dynamic of where we're coming at with this industry. Okay, nobody's biting. Well, I mean, I where you want to start? I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to bite. <laughs> Go ahead, Charlie. I'll, I'll follow you. I mean, parting comment would be that I I think that it's not just clearly it's not just Checker Spot. You have Amris, you have Wands Attack, and you have many others that see a future that moves us post petroleum. That see ways to take into consideration what it means to be in business for good what it means to take into consideration these externalities. And you can either choose to be part of finding solutions and embrace the risk and run towards that opportunity, or you can choose for more of the same and be part of the problem that's not sustainable. And I think that's fundamentally like for an audience at a university, where do you wanna be? Where do you want your imprints to be? Do you wanna be part of the solution or do you want to be part of perpetuating more of the same? Bill? I was just going to add, I think as consumers, you have a choice of where you spend your money, and that's very powerful. But 
There's also a limited GDP. I, I've given a bunch of lectures around the country and I go through the Coke bottle, you know, the plant bottle, which is a, an endeavor to try to have a lot, slightly more renewable packaging. And, but one very insightful student said, you know, it costs more money. And I don't think anybody wouldn't mind paying 1.2 cents instead of one cent for a bottle of water. But she said, but if you're telling me everything in my world is gonna cost me 20% more, I can't afford that. And there's only so much GDP in the world. So as a society, we've got to decide, you know, we don't have enough infrastructure, we can't pay for healthcare, we can't pay for education, we have a national debt. You know, we're gonna to have to decide how we allocate that GDP. And the issue is the externalities of CO2 are just not in our current business model. And, and it's a global problem because if you just try to do something unilaterally in the United States, put $100 a ton carbon tax, all that would happen is the industry would just move offshore, you know, because they're not competitive with that tax. And we can't agree on a universal policy on exchange rates. So, so it's a very, I think consumers have more power, but it, it, it is a balancing between wanting to do good and financial realities. Consumers still want money to return in their stock market. And, and so I'm on a couple of boards and we have this SG or ESG analysis. And, but there's not a, there's a very small percentage. Most people, you can say, I didn't make as much money because I did good is not accepted. It's I did good and I made the same amount of money or more. So it's finding that and, and as consumers, you know, we've got to continue to decide, we'll give up a little of this to pay for more of this and somehow institutionalize this externality, which right now just is, not whether it's energy or uh, consumer goods, it's, 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 a, it's a hidden cost that we just don't factor in the economics. It, it makes it a, a hard problem. Very good. So how do we allocate the GDP Next topic there, Scott, is going to be uh, wealth redistribution and bio-based uh, chemicals. All right, uh, Beth or Rachel, would one of you like to give us a closing comment on this topic? Okay, I'll jump in. Um, right, yeah, I think that's all true. And although lots of surveys say that people want sustainable products, if you take a look at uh, purchasing behavior, it does trail. I think Bill's correct on that. However, that's where we are today. If you look at some of the statistics for millennial and Gen Z, the world is changing and decisions are changing and buying a house isn't as important as it used to be and buying your own car isn't as important as it, as it used to be. Owning material things is not as important. Having great experiences and looking at a healthy planet are way higher on the value chain than they are for Gen X and you know boomers, et cetera. So I think there is, we're at a moment right now, I think the pandemic has given us, uh, has literally sent us to our rooms to go think about it. So I think we have a time now to kind of like come back out and say, all right, so, how are we gonna get our business ready for the generation that's coming up, the purchasers that are coming up? And I think um, the one thing to pay attention, which is what you said in the beginning, Kieran, was um, pay very, very close attention to consumers, get engaged in conversations with consumers um, and use and leverage those conversations um, within larger conversations around business strategy and then build the business case um, to be ready for when they come. And again, have that long-term view. I think that's a real key point. You go back to the 60s or 70s, how did you show you were cool like the Fonz? You needed to have that Harley Davidson motorcycle or the Ford T-Bird or something. Now, you just need that awesome Instagram pic. And uh, not without a footprint, but it's a much smaller footprint, I would say. Okay, Rachel, you get to follow up on the Fonz. Well, I don't, I, I don't know how I can follow all that. So I completely agree and just wanted to add that um, um, for the third quarter analogy in the Super Bowl, love that. Uh, agree wholeheartedly. And I think there are some short term um, premiums, maybe, but showing that long term path to price equity goes a long way, right? So showing, you know, for example, if your process is electricity intensive, showing that with reduction in electricity prices that will improve your overall economics, um, showing that long term path is really important. And we also as well see it from the brands, especially in the EU. Uh, flight shaming is a very real thing that um, definitely played into the launch of our lands of jet entity last year, um, launching a sustainable aviation fuel company in the midst of a pandemic when no flights were uh, leaving. So um, I guess in summary, um, we want to be on the front lines of that. And uh, thanks for the conversation. No, very good. And I'll leave everyone with one last comment on this dynamic as well is you know, I challenge all the researchers, show me a better carbon sequestration technique out there than taking CO2 from the atmosphere via a plant, feeding it to a microbe or microalgae perhaps, converting that into a non-biodegradable 
plastic that gets thrown in the landfill. I mean, when you think about it, you're locking up that atmospheric CO2 and then putting it back below ground. Doesn't sound really nice, does it? But maybe that's the way we want to work things. But anyway, thank you very, very much to the panelists. This has been a fun conversation, I will say. You know, it's been a while since I dived back into the world of bio-based materials and it's been really enjoyable, particularly to see my old colleague, Charlie here as well. Um, but if we missed any questions, I think there's an email address in the chat there, feel free to reach out and we'll do our best to answer them. But at this point, we'll sign off and say, good night, everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.